method that I highly recommend, use your, your um, purveyors. You know, when you, when you are buying something, ask them every question you have. Think of questions to ask. You know, if you're giving them your business, and don't, you know, if you possibly can, once again, you know, not that Walmart sells a, a, a motorized backpack sprayer or even a pump-up backpack sprayer, but, you know, if you go to a place that can't answer the question and you think there's someplace nearby that can, go buy it from the people that do the customer service, that have the information you need, you know, um, because that's the critical part. You, know, you, need, you need to know all the pieces. You know, you need to know. Uh, my favorite example has to do it's with um, insects. But it's my classic. For years, I put beneficial nematodes out. If people want to talk about them more than what I say for the example, we'll do it in a break, okay? But I put beneficial nematodes out with mixed results. Mixed results. And the reason the results were mixed was because I hadn't learned until I had an irrigation problem that if they sit in the sun for seven minutes, they become sterilized. And the way they control pests is they go inside them through the pest orifice and multiply inside. If they're sterilized, can't control the pests. And so when it was cloudy, I was successful. When it was sunny, I was unsuccessful. You know? And so when I called up my 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 salesman, Jim um, Klutz from Beneficial Insect Company, and told him my situation, the irrigation is down, I said, Pat, yeah, if you get it up early in the morning, you'll be okay. But remember, after seven minutes, they're sterilized. And I said, what do you mean remember? You never told me that. <laughs> Silence, you know? <laughs> so, you know, a classic question I have is, is there any things I should know about this? You know? Yeah. Any tricks you use when using this, you know? Um, anything you wouldn't use it on. You know, it should all be in the label, but you know, sometimes the information from somebody that's worked with it is real good. You know? mm -hmm. um, okay, so we're still on sunlight, and that's how we got that problem by having the shade come over thing, you know, we know we want at least five or six hours of sunlight, right? But also, things like late blight. Everybody here grows tomatoes, right? I'd be afraid you're an alien if you did. <laughs> uh, and do you all, how do you space them? Just everybody say what your spacing is. Distance between each plant. Not very much. Six to eight inches, maybe. Okay. Yeah. At least 24 to 36. Okay, that's more where I am. Three feet. Yeah. Yep. Three feet. Well, probably only two. Some of them less than two, maybe. Not commercially. Right. right, well, you oh, grow them no, whatever. Do you? Just in my yard, yeah. Uh, I don't remember. Okay. Very sometimes close, sometimes two, three feet. Okay. I'm about 18 inches. And you? About 18 inches. Okay. Um, when you vary, when you vary, do you notice any difference in how they do? Well, the last couple of years I've been decimated with light and not. And where you grown them close or far apart? Uh, the whole area within two years, within the last two years, just jumped everywhere. Okay, but still, did you go yours close or far apart? Um, about two foot, some okay, foot. Well, then it's hard to tell. But see, I would, I would actually suggest that even though you're going to get wiped out, the onset of disease would be later if you had a more like two foot. I think in our climate, two foot's a, two foot's a minimum. You know? Because we always are going to get some pressure from early blight and very possibly from late blight. All we need is a cool, wet spell, and we have early blight. You know, I mean, you're not early in the season, I mean late blight rather, not early in the season because it tends not to show up until after the plant, plants go into flower. But once those plants are in the flower, if we have a, temperatures below 60 and it's wet, we're going to see late blight. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and spacing can really help you not get that initial infection to spread. The air you know, can land on one or two plants and not spread rapidly because there's lots of air circulation, they get tons of sun. And that's the point there, is the sun. You know, if you have it so that no plant is shading another one, then they get sun all the time. And a lot of that late blight that comes in gets fried by the UV rays. You know? So having that, that spacing, and then of course, they really go together because you also want the air circulation. You know? um, and how you get the air circulation um, is if you plant one row of tomatoes, let's say on this line here, right, and they're all spaced two feet apart. The next row you start, you go in one foot and plant a tomato, so that then they're alternated, right? Mm -hmm. And if you're really going to get into this, I took a, 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 
uh, interplanting workshop from Mark Bouillot. He really got me to think about that, and we do it sometimes. I mean, it's, lots of times we're going to get one kind of plant in the ground mode and don't think about it. When we think about it, it's a good strategy. If you planted a tomato and then a summer squash, which needs at least two feet, and then a tomato, which and you gave it the two feet spacing still, you'd end up with a four foot spacing for every every tomato. And that kind of interplanting gives you even more, not only disease control, I mean sunlight you know, effect, but also more airflow because that squash is down nice and low. Yeah. So you can really do that intercropping, can maximize that sun even more. So just strategize on how to maximize the sun, you know, um, and, and circulation. You know, that's a, a huge cultural, cultural practice that's, that's major. And I, it, 18 inches, who did it with 18 inches again? And have you done just as well in late blight seasons as other people, or not as well? Or this is my first um, season planting in Western North Carolina. Okay. So yeah, so forget about 18 inches. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. What about you? Uh, well, I had them in, in pots, and I'm moving around. I'm moving into better sun. Uh huh. You know, so you did okay yeah. because you were. I, I actually I got it. Maybe didn't even get it compared to my neighbors, uh -huh. and they're all stuck in one small area. And, uh -huh. and yeah, right. it was way late that I had any problem at all. Uh, right, yeah. So you actually were creating spacing by moving your plants yeah, around. Moving, yeah, 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 yeah. So it didn't count. Yeah. Okay, so that's, you know... Patrick, could I say one thing? Yeah, sure. Well, several years ago at a grower school, I took a class on some of this stuff by a professor from down the country. Can't remember his name. And in the lecture, he said that there was a man over here at the horticulture center that was doing research on it. So I went to him afterwards and got the man's name and went over there and he didn't, I can't remember his name, but he's an Indian. Mm -hmm. And he had somebody, the interesting thing was while I was with him, he was talking on the phone the whole time. Right, yeah. But he had somebody come from his office with two little brown envelopes of tomato seeds. Yeah. One of them is a cherry, a large cherry tomato, and I have had it be alive and producing tomatoes until Thanksgiving, even though all the others died from the late blight. And so I'm just mentioning it. That, yeah. uh, the other one was a bigger one and didn't keep the resistance as long, probably, right? I can't remember about the other one, but uh, See, look, that was the one that, that... Those are the genetics that I think Randy Gardner initially developed, and I got to try some of those too, and they were very effective in a not heavy late blight pressure year, and then a little bit less effective in a heavier year the next year, but still doing pretty well. Yeah. By the third year, they were no longer effective. Now the cherry yeah. kept its resistance, but the bigger ones, you know, did not keep its keep their resistance because the top their infestins, the, the infective agent of late blight, yeah. is like AIDS. It's incredibly able to adapt. Oh. You know, it breeds around almost anything, yeah. oh. and Randy recognized that, and that that may happen with defiant too. Yeah. You know, um, the cherry is much closer to the original plant. Yeah. And so my, and this is speculation, but my speculation is that it has more genetic space, right? You haven't taken up so, room, so much room pushing that plant away from what it originally was to keep its resistance. Most cherries have more resistance naturally. Yeah. And then if you breed in resistance, yeah. it's going to stay better, you know? Yeah, I've been raising that Alan Chadwick uh, cherry tomato saving my own seeds for about 15 and years. And it's probably very resistant too, right? And it does pretty good yeah, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's true in general. It's, I mean, if you if you let your tomatoes come, like the hybrids go to seed and they come up as volunteers, what do you tend to get? Cherry tomatoes? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Those tend to be pretty resistant. Yes, they are. You know? they, they just threw away all that flavor package, all that other stuff. They went for the basics, stay alive, make seed. Yes. You know? And yeah. so, that's, you know, that's not uncommon at all. Um, okay, so, as far as how to space other plants, you know, we could, we could be here for hours if I try to tell you the spacing on every kind of plant. There's pretty good guides and catalogs like Johnny's and um, Fedco, those kinds of catalogs. They, they have pretty darn good guides for how to, how to space things. And there's a lot of variation, you know, um, when I'm talking to conventional growers, they, they will oftentimes put their broccoli 12 inches apart. Um, and that's because they, you know, they're trying to sell stuff that goes to the store. They don't want a head bigger than this, you know. I go for 15 inches, I want heads like this. Yeah. Um, you know, I want lots of big side shoots. It's better for me that I space better because that circulation is going to help with disease. You know? So for that particular disease, the biggest one is that I mulch good or do um, low till and have stubble on the ground because the disease comes from the ground. It's an area. You know? 
What do you recommend for winter squash? Space wise, mm -hmm. I I think six feet. That's what I do. Uh, a, but I know lots of farmers that do three, two. You know. I'm doing long rows where they'll have, we'll have room to grow wide, but I need them to be spaced. Close. Yeah, that'll work. I mean, it's giving them the room wide. I see. I mm -hmm. tend to not go as wide. You know, I tend to go on. Um, it's like you know from. From the, from the end of one path to the um, end of another path with a bed, you know, the path on both sides of a bed is about seven feet, mm -hmm. you know. That's right. not that wide, you know. So there's only going to be like three feet or something in between each bed, you know. Um, and so... The space that I'm looking at with, you know, tractor row, five foot center to center on the, on the tractor. Yeah, then you're fine at that at that One space. foot spacing between plants? I think that's perfectly fine. Yeah, they just need the room to go somewhere. Right. You know? Uh, we actually are still hoping to find the perfect piece of tractor land, so we're still doing small, small, small beds, you know? And so in that situation, you don't want tractor rows because you, you're going to walk it on them and you need that land to grow. True. So that's why I space them more like that, you know? But a lot of people would be at, at three or four. I still like six for the more rampant growing ones. And it really depends on the squash. You know, um, the ones like Delicata and stuff that don't get very big, they get space closer, mm -hmm. you know. But the candy roasters, they get some space, <laughs> you know. Um, and they're worth every bit of it, you know. Um, so, yeah, there's, you know, there are those kinds of variations, you know, and it depends on your situation. But always, you know, go for the maximum spacing you can, you know. And in your situation, you're not going to intercrop. That's, you know, yeah. <laughs> definitely not. But for a home grower, intercropping is really wise with something like um, winter squash. Because you know? it gives you a large area where there's a low area and the air comes over. And most of the things like tomatoes and stuff, pretty soon their lower leaves aren't even important anymore. You're taking them off. So then there's a circulation completely above it. Meanwhile, down low, you have squash growing. Yeah. That doesn't mean I say let the squash grow right around the tomato. Boy, that'll raise some humidity. You know, I mean, you still want to keep it off the tomato. But you have that area around it, that's going to be really good. Um, Okay, mulching. You probably don't mulch too big, too big an area. Yeah, um, I wouldn't either if I was doing tractor stuff like that. But you might really look at. I highly recommend next month's workshop because that's Dr. Ron Morris, and he's working. You know, he retired as the ex, the main scientist for no-till conventional. He helped to get that going. He retired as professor emeritus at Virginia Tech. His specialty is low-till organic. Mm -hmm and dynamic cover cropping and strip tillage. He's going to come here and we're going to show it as best we can. We've got the huge disadvantage that when we timed our cover crops to be ready was considering a normal summer, normal winter, and they're all way early and we're having to cut them way early so they don't set seed. So he's not going to have as much um, you know, roughage as we'd like, as much stubble. But his technique, which would really apply to you, and I highly recommend for home growers too, um, recommend it really swallowed that word for home growers also um, is to kill your cover crop but it's easy to kill which is right now because they're in full bloom okay and all the energy is in the flowers so you kill them some way we're mowing them because we haven't come up with a roller but I'm hot on the trail of a roller for the front of a um, walk behind tractor um, and rolling is better actually it crimps them and they die even you know, more completely because there's some effort to still get energy to the top and the roots get ignored because they're trying to make seed. If you cut it, then the roots, this is speculation, but I bet it's true. If you cut it, then the roots only game is in the roots. You know, there's no attempt to keep the top going. Mm -hmm. That's why I think rolling is even more effective. Yeah. Yeah. But we may need to till it one more time. If, if it stays cool, those, co those mowed cover crops will come back you know, from their roots. But if it gets hot, they die completely once they've been cut or knocked over. And there's a, if you go to Rodale, and, and click on the sec someplace on their site or search their site for no-till. They've got a pic got pictures of a woman who's got some kind of a chain with handles, a heavy chain, and she walks and drops her chain so that it knocks the cover crop down and bends a bunch over, right? And then she steps to where it's not bent over and she drops it again and bends it over. You know, and she can walk straddling her bed. It's not. It's a. You know, it's, it's a simple person tool. It's not a power tool. But you can still get that effect. And you would not. You would not want to do that. You know. No. But you think maybe a, would like a drag harrow or something do that sort of. It effect? might do it. I'd play with it. You know. People have talked about driving their tillers backwards over. You know. Hmm. And then that knocks it down enough. You know. The first thing it gets knocked down by the um, 
by the back of the structure, right. and then the since it's knocked down, it's not as much as it gets caught up in the tillers because still they turn a little bit, you know. Yeah. Um, people have used various things, but a drag harrow might work. You might have something that'll kind of accomplish that, you know. I'd play with a little spot mm -hmm. and see if you can get it. If you can get good cr good crimp, that's what to do. Don't for things like tomatoes and stuff or squ winter squash even. If you haven't turned your cover crop in, you'd be way ahead of the game. Unless this is your first year and you really need that nutri nutrition in the yeah, soil. It is, it is the first year. Then I'd say well, instead, come to Ron's workshop and look at his strip tillage techniques, you know? Because he's doing like very small tillage and leaving the rest of the area in the cover crop, you know? Mm -hmm. So that he has maximum organic matter on the soil. You know? And then you might even come through in your walkways and flail mow or somehow cut it where you can get enough of that stuff. And then if you had some kind of a tool that can push that over, you know, as the squash are getting a little big, you would get that same kind of effect on a big scale, you know. Mm -hmm. And squash, once they're getting rampant, if they get a little bit on top of them, it won't bother them. Mm -hmm. They'll just push right through it, you know. But for squash with disease, it won't do you a bit of good. Why you would want to do it is it would raise your water retention, cool your soil, you know, and have that slow feed, you know. And it's just better practices in general, you know, for building your soil. If you don't disturb it, the soil builds up better, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, but for tomatoes, why you want to do it is that works as a mulch. And if you have a mulch, you reduce the Alton area. You, know, you reduce the soil borne diseases. I mean, late bite can be in the soil too, but more of a commonly it's in the air. You know? And it doesn't live in our soils, it doesn't overwinter. It needs, it's host obligated, it needs a host to survive the winter. 